Welcome back to the KDPG Sunday edition. We are remembering a Pittsburgh icon, Bruno Sammartino, the Hall of Fame professional wrestler. We're joined by two of his close friends, Larry Richard and Jim Crenn, two Pittsburgh legends in their own rights. You guys got to travel with him to Italy just this past summer for a couple of honors. Tell us about that. Well, Jimmy, we get to this little town. It's a little hamlet on the top of the Apennine Mountains, and when Bruno arrives, the whole town lights up. Can He's you a rock star. He's a Can rock star. Can you imagine there. being in a place where the most famous person in the world is with you? Like in that Chicago time with Ken Rice. Outside of David, yes. you being here with Ken, and vice versa. So they, they are fully aware of the legend of Bruno Sammartino in his home. It was his, wild. Everybody did they the watch it, him on TV there? Yes. His childhood home is a national historic landmark. Um, and everybody, they sent basically the 60 minutes of Rome came out to do a story. There were stations represented from all over Europe, and they had put up this statue uh, right off to the side of the piazza there. And then right behind the statue is a building that they have dedicated to the memory of Bruno's mother, Emilia. And that's why Bruno went. And we were there. It was 100 degrees. He was, the demands on him even that day, Jimmy. You know, yeah, and he, and he was uh, uh, you know, bigger than wrestling in a way because he, he, would, he went there many times and he was part of that community and did a lot of things just as he's part of Pittsburgh, he was part of that community. So that was, uh, so people that maybe didn't see him wrestle or whatever, he was there as being, like I said, someone who served others, someone who helped the community. But you don't, you, you don't think he would have gone if it was just for the statue? No. The, the naming of the, of the clinic? No, he basically said, yeah, I'm doing this for my mother. I yeah. couldn't. I couldn't live with myself if I didn't do this for her. And in the documentary, that, that, uh, as it unfolds, some of the, the things that, the sacrifices that his mom made huh, like, were, were, were beyond in, belief. Yes. Beyond belief. And to when keep you're him there, alive in the family. Physically, to see what she had to overcome, the obstacles. So several years ago, we took Bruno and a small group of people back to where they hid from the Nazis. He had never been there and swore he wouldn't go. But that's really where the story begins. And, and you, you needed know? three or four people to corroborate the story. That's how, that's how crazy it was, or how wild it was. And you produced this documentary. Let me interrupt you here. Well, let's take a look at some of this. We have a, a, a piece of the documentary that you produced. Let's take a look. Today, it's hard to imagine this quiet and picturesque mountain village in Abruzzo, Italy, was a living hell in 1943, when the Nazi SS troops stormed in with their machine guns blazing, killing and scattering men, women, and children. Bruno escaped with his brother, sister, and mother to a remote mountaintop called Valaraca. For the first time in 67 years, he recently returned to their hiding place. I've seen people die, people buried up there. Remembering when mom couldn't come down here, we went as much three or four days eating snow because there was nothing else that you could eat. And I remember then getting sick and deathly sick. And, uh, and if the war had continued for another month or two, nobody would have ever heard of Bruno San Martino. For 14 months, they struggled to survive, all while his father was working in Pittsburgh, trapped between worlds. I have very mixed emotions because as you, uh, I've, t I've blocked all this stuff out. And I, last night, in fact, I couldn't sleep because that's all I thought about. Bruno's friend Marty Lazaro was touched by the story of courage. He compelled Bruno to climb the rock again for a documentary that executive producer Ken Brown and videographer Josh Burt have been working on for seven years. I'm 75 years old. I think it's important to, to revisit, especially if the, to, if the story is going to be told. With his son Daryl and friends by his side, we made the journey, first driving a third of the way, then pulled in a makeshift wagon by a local farmer. Finally, the rest by foot. A four-hour journey for us took Bruno's mother, Amelia, an entire day to walk back then. I'm overwhelmed by it because... I put myself in her place. I wonder, was I man enough if I could have ever done it? This is where Bruno discovered his inner strength. My mom had the heart of a lion. The sacrifices she made were, were beyond human. Amelia would sneak back into the village to get food under the noses of the SS guards. I remember as sickly as I was, I used to sit on top of a rock looking down that path, waiting for mom. To make sure that, that she would come back. And as the hours went by, he panicked more and more. She was captured once and escaped, but not before she was shot through the arm. But somehow she made it back. I remember when I would spot her 
and she would be coming up and uh, for a while, for a short while, there was no hunger, there was no pain, there was no sickness, there was no thirst, nothing. It was such a great joy to see. And then they were discovered by the SS. They lined us all up and they set a machine gun. But I remember my mother holding me up and all she kept saying was not to be afraid that we were going to be happy and no more suffering, no more hunger, no more cold. Miraculously, the would-be executioners were overpowered by some men from their village and they were saved. Finally, we reached the summit of Valaraca. It's, it's tough, Larry, it's tough. Uh, the memories are very painful, they really are. As painful and horrific an experience for eight-year-old Bruno, today, surprisingly, he has no regrets. And, and look, I've been so fortunate. I, I, I got healthy, I got big, I got strong, I got to travel the world, I've been everywhere. It was all because of my mom. With a mountain of a man, Bruno Sammartino in Abruzzo, Italy. Larry Richard, KDKA TV News. Documentary is called La Mia Mama. Oh, when can people see it? A lot of fans are no doubt going to be very interested in that. Well, we'll talk with uh, his wife, Carol, and family and feel when it's appropriate for them. And then we'll have a premiere here in Pittsburgh, and then it will be distributed worldwide. Excellent. Jim, you wanted to share a story. Yeah, you know, a lot of serious things that, and, and great things that he did see. But one of the nice things about Bruno that made him so genuine down on earth and Ray was a sense of humor. He was really a funny guy. And he was a wonderful storyteller. And I remember being in Pizza Ferrata, we're in a hotel bar and hanging out, me and Larry and Bruno. And, and I say, what's the craziest thing you ever did? And kind of thing. And he goes, oh, yeah. He goes, I wrestled the monkey once. I'm like, what? And Larry had known the story, starts laughing. He goes, I got to tell the story. Haven't we all? And I can't do it justice, <laughs> but Bruno would, yeah, Bruno would tell the story. He goes, yeah, I thought it was a, you wouldn't be well, a little monkey. He told that story in the Yale Club once, right? See, there, it, it was an orangutan. It ended up being an orangutan. He arrested some fair. And the guy was going to give him like 150 bucks. Then. And he's like, 150 bucks, Jimmy. I was making a dollar an hour. And I just had a kid. And he's telling me, well, yeah. So he goes, uh, two falls. The first one, the orangutan's all over him. He scratches, bleeding. He goes, I don't think I could do it. The second one, he has to get the buck 50. So he said, the thing, gets, the animal gets him in a headlock. He goes, I can't breathe, Jimmy. I don't know what to do. Because <laughs> I see his stomach moving. So I hit him with everything. The orangutan drops. The crowd goes nuts. And the guy jumps in and goes, I'm not paying you. You hurt my monkey. He goes, I didn't get paid. I'm on the floor laughing. <laughs> I'm like, that, Bruno, that is the funniest thing ever, man. Oh. And he just had story after story. Yeah. Uh, but that was part of the charm of it. Uh, Bruno always was, he, no matter how famous, he was one of the guys. And the, the Rat Pack. Which I loved about him. <laughs> uh, when he sold out at Madison Square Garden 188 times, the last <laughs> being his Hall of Fame induction, um, there was a guy named Jilly, this famous place where all the celebrities, there were anybody in New York, used to go. And Jilly was a big fan and would come pick him up. Of course he wanted to pick him up. He wanted him in his restaurant. And guys like Frank Sinatra would be like, hey, champ, you know. And even some underworld people who Bruno had no idea they were underworld people, Sam wants to meet you. And he goes, oh, I'm busy. Yeah. yeah, you know that Sam. Yeah. And finally he met the guy, and he still didn't know who he was. And he says, four times he turned him down, and they go, you can't turn this down another time. So they pick him up, they take him to see Sam, right. and he's sitting there, and he goes, Sam G. He goes, Bruno, he said, you know, you and I, both in very dangerous businesses. <laughs> and it wasn't until after the fact that someone said, you know, that was Bruno. He goes, I don't know. So he was so genuinely humble yeah. and unaffected by right. his own fame. Right. And, and you know, the other thing uh, you point out is that uh, I always saw he, he got emotional uh, and so sincere when he talked about fans and the people that support him. He goes, I owe everything to those people, Jimmy. I owe everything. And he always felt that. I thought that was just the coolest thing, man. He's, I mean, really, he's eyes well. And he, was, he really appreciated the love that we, uh, that we all gave him. Guys, and, and this was continue. black and white wrestling mm -hmm. as opposed to today with in color, yeah. in color wrestling. Yeah. Um, what was people of all ages, and you always hear the story about an 85-year-old grandmother mm -hmm. sitting with his kid watching the wrestling on Saturday. Why, why, why wrestling? I, I think that, I think it's because it's simple. It's, like you said, black and white, yes, and color, but still black and white in the sense that it's good versus evil. Yep. You had the good guy, you had the bad guy. It was simple to watch. It was fun. And they assigned good guy and bad guy before. And the thing is, like I, you mentioned my grandmother, hey, she came on a boat at 15 year olds 15 years old from Poland, and you know, there were probably a lot of first or even second generation, whatever people that came over, 
like Bruno, and he right. was that guy who, hey, overcame everything from language barriers to whatever to succeed. And I think part of it was that for those people and the other people empathizing through those people. But I think in, in the good versus evil thing, and, and like I said, that's why I kept saying he's bigger than wrestling up because it wasn't just that for that particular man, Bruno. He took it to another level by just sharing it with people. And, and, and I was too, in Madison Square Garden five years ago when he was inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame, and Arnold Schwarzenegger flew in off a movie set all the way from California just to do his induction speech by request. And Arnold was so genuine and gracious. And you thought, wow. And then person after person, a Secret Service agent who served five presidents came up just to keep an eye on him. Uh, and Donald Trump at that time, who was not on the radar politically, but was certainly a big deal, was inducted the same night because he and Vince McMahon were friends. He came into the dressing room four different times. Bruno, I want you to meet my, my kids. He brought the kids in. He brought uh, several other people. And then the last time he goes, Bruno, this is the fourth time. He goes, I want you to meet the man who moves most of the money in Manhattan. He's the president of Deutsche Bank. <laughs> and Bruno was, oh, very gracious. And this president of Deutsche Bank became a 12-year-old boy before our very eyes and said, oh, Bruno, I can't tell you what it meant for me as a child to sit there with my grandfather and watch you wrestle because he was the everyman and, and we, man. we need that thing too in life I think where you know we're all going through life with the, to see uh, good wins and, and, I, and I don't mean in the wrestling sense good wins in the sense that, that they admired him because the way he carried himself and his integrity and the kind of person he was that's what I mean when he says he's trans said to wrestling but good wins and, and that's what he kind of reminds you of is something that's we, right. we aspire to be like the guy he, he's a hundred percent first rate human being that's at, why we're mourning him at the height of the Sopranos run first run Mm -hmm. Okay, on television, he was asked to be to be at least a recurring role or cast member, and you know what? He refused, and you know why? Because he said, "I would never use the F word." Yeah. He would not swear. Yeah. And he that's the integrity well, level. He would not. This is the hottest show on TV at the right. time. But he had right. his, yeah. He said no. His way of doing things. He knew yeah. who he was. And it was, wasn't part of his integrity calling out WWE. For a while. And he felt right. that it was, you know, become steroids, vulgarity, uh, sleaziness. And it, he, he had to be convinced. He had to be talked into being inducted into the Hall of Fame. They, they, they had to tone it. Yeah. He wouldn't go in unless they toned it down. He walked away from... Probably a lot of money and extra fame and all the stuff he could have had that he walked away from it for integrity. To three say no, people. Till, till they toned it down. That helped broker quick. the peace. Marty Lazaro, the late Marty Lazaro locally. Dr. Joseph Maroon. Yeah. Who, Steelers who operated Norsen, on Bruno, right? Yes. Yeah. And Triple H, Paul Levesque, who's married to Stephanie McMahon from the WWE. Those three men helped broker that peace after 27 years. And aren't we all glad that they shook hands. Mm -hmm. Guys, great memories. We'll take a break back with some notes about uh, Bruno Sammartino's funeral in a moment.